Clubs, diamonds, hearts, spades, those four little black and red pips you see at the top of a standard French deck of playing cards. Bicycle, tricycle, motorcycle, playboy, whatever set you're playing with, you're likely familiar with the four symbols found on one of the most universal game pieces ever created. Alongside the likes of the various figures of chess, the alternating dark and light squares of checkers boards, and the cross and rings of tic-tac-toe, these four suits are ingrained in the history of game design. Across prison mess halls, boy scout summer camps, gift shops, casinos, and military barracks, you're likely never far off from being able to get a set in your hand. Regardless of their iterations, the detailing and alteration, whether they are Star Wars or picturesque mountainscapes or the cast of Duck Dynasty placed in the artwork in between, there is a constant simplicity to the design of these suits that lends to a wide degree of versatility in the interpretation and implementation of the basic deck of 54 into countless variations of card games. And that's fascinating to think about on its own, but I want to raise a novel question. There are four suits. What if there were more? Well, the thing is, there kind of already are, but it's not quite so simple to nail down. Today, I want to take a look at how other card games and manufacturers in the past have handled creating alternative or extra suits. I'll compare the prevalence and impact of certain symbols in the gaming zeitgeist, and then I want to analyze the more design philosophy of the first four suits, how they can be applied in the evaluation and possible creation of additional sets and symbols. Let's start off with something simple. By far, the most common fifth suit added to playing card decks is the star. And for good reason. Radially symmetrical, filled with unique symbolism and importance to a variety of cultures, the star is a go-to for symbols in any sort of design medium. Why do you think they're so common on national flags? However, this is actually a more recent phenomenon for playing cards. The star was found in gold as the fifth suit in five-star playing cards, introduced for use in poker in 1991 by Five Star Games. Stars are also found in the Five Crowns 1996 deck as one of five colors, as well as in the Fifth Dimension in 2008, and in recent years as both black and red under star deck playing cards. Historically, however, there is much more inconsistency for what the fifth suit was. In the late 1930s, five-suit bridge became an international trend, starting in Vienna of 1937, as rules for the game were published by Walter M. Marsile and Paul Stern. Their version took the green leaves of the German William Tell cards, normally in place of spades, and transplanted them into the normal French suits. Several card companies in the UK, in typical British fashion, stole the idea and replaced the leaf with a blue or green crown called the Royal. As the king and queen got a hold of these self-flattering cards in March of 1938, so did the United States. In typical American fashion, they avoided paying royalties to the Anglos over copyright and replaced the royal with a green eagle. History has a bit of a humorous consistency to it. Parker Brothers, the creator of the game Monopoly and another American company now owned by Hasbro, also joined the trend with a green rook, shaped like a tower as their alternative. However, in summer 1938, the difficulty of learning a fifth suit into normal playing card games decreased the popularity of adding these additional suits, and the trend died off. Fun fact, James Blish, the science fiction author who created the term Gas Giant, titled his first novel Jack of Eagles, the title referring to the ESP powers the main character develops, which makes him different from the rest of the world, just as how the Eagle suit was developed to set aside American decks from those being made at the time. But back to cards. 2006 saw estate playing cards introduced green waves as their fifth suit for five card poker. This strange symbol essentially takes the form of two ovals pressed together in a vaguely wavish manner. Interestingly, one of the earliest examples of extra suits being added into a deck was the six-suited international playing cards, created by American Hiram Jones in 1895. In typical American fashion, the added suits were black bullets and red crosses, which nowadays would be considered a violation of the Geneva Convention. Of course, American playing cards would pay homage to our god and our guns. And I'm proud to be an American, where at least I know I'm free. 1964 would see new deck Sextet Bridge introducing rackets and wheels, two blue suits for their Sextet deck adding a color, but still balancing the number of suits per color. In similar fashion to the crosses and bullets of Hiram Jones, 1982 saw MS Hongen Bridge introduce black stars alongside red bells, with bells taken from another form of diamond used in historic German decks, 
Likewise, the 1990 Empire deck saw the Return of the Crown, this time in red, alongside black anchors. Deck 6 in 2016 is among the most recent in this trend, with red shields and black cups, which is really weird because in Italian tarot cards, cups is the precursor to hearts, which are red. Yeah, finally, among the commercial decks with the most playing card suits that I've come across includes the creatively named Eight Suits Playing Cards, created for Euchre in the 70s. Red Moons, red four-leaf clovers because having black three-leaf clovers wasn't enough, black stars again, and black tears. I feel like saying that statement will get me demonetized. Fat Pack Cards in the UK counters this arrangement with red roses and doves, and black tridents and axes. And finally, in a display of terrifying early CGI, Toss TM Double Deluxe decks adds blue castles and shields and golden crosses and oracles, which I think are supposed to be like angels or something? The four base suits themselves have actually undergone a surprising degree of change over time across their various portrayals. While playing card suits as an idea likely originate in China as representations of coins and currency, the earliest derivations we'd find familiar are Latin. Coins, clubs, cups, and swords. You'll often find these representations on tarot cards, with coins otherwise called pentacles for Italian versions. In the 15th century, Germanic speakers in Switzerland and Germany sought to replace these with their own nature-themed suits for various reasons. Cups became roses or flowers, coins became bells, clubs were acorns, and swords were replaced by shields. Over time, hearts came to replace roses, and leaves replaced shields in Germany. Around 1480, the French got a hold of things and swapped diamonds or tiles for bells, clovers for acorns, and spades or pikes for leaves. This is when the suits were sorted into their red and black pairings. When adapted into British territory, the classic Latin term club was taken from the more well-known Italian tarot and used to refer to the clover suit, which is why this looks nothing like this. All of this is to say that the meaning of these symbols have shifted greatly over time, but consistent threads can be drawn throughout. Dragoncompany.org has two really great articles examining how the modern incarnations of the suits thematically borrow and align with one another, and I'll be borrowing some of my points from their attempts to design new suits. Links in the description. First and foremost, the suits, or pips as they're called, are meant to be simple. Let's try an experiment. Take out a piece of paper and draw a diamond. Easy, right? Now draw a heart. Yours might be a bit lopsided, but still, not too hard. Now draw a spade. It's just an upside-down heart with a tail or a base, so no problem. Now draw a club. Three circles, a tail or a base, and done. Okay. Now I want you to draw an eagle. Like, a whole eagle. Now draw ten eagles cramped into a small 2 by 3 inch space. Do you see the issue here? As Dragon Company points out, all of the suits are constructed from simple curves and straight lines. The most complicated one, clubs, is still only made from six of these lines. The more detail you put into a pip, the harder it is for players to reproduce by hand, and the less likely it is to catch on. This is part of why the star works so well. While few people can accurately freehand a perfect five-pointed decagon, if you do the crossover line trick, it's still pretty easy. Also, in Star's favor, there is the meaning of the symbol. A heart is related to love, passion, life. Diamonds have wealth. Spades and clubs bring connotations of war and violence, and alternatively, the clover brings luck and prosperity. These are solid universal ideas that we can attach to these symbols and recognize from appearance alone. What the heck is a wave supposed to be? And how much can anyone really relate to the idea of an anchor or a tennis racket? These two factors, simplicity and recognition, are a large part of why the suits changed from their original incarnations. In the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries, it just wasn't that feasible to print detailed, multicolored images of tiny leaves and acorns and swords on mass-produced playing cards. Together, based on these principles, you can eliminate most of the unique suits that I've shown you so far. But let's try and use them to make some new suits. First, let's brainstorm some ideas based on what the colors mean. Black is tied to war and aggression. Spades at one point has been both swords and shields. Black uses tools, but it also has a hand in the natural world. Spades are agricultural instruments, and their past includes clovers, leaves, and acorns. Contrastingly, 
red is all about love and peace, heart being pretty self-explanatory, and also diamond engagement rings, I guess. More so, it also ties to wealth and luxury, money, coins, the ability to sit surrounded by shiny golden bells and doodads and drink from a full cup, to have money to protect yourself and to build a good life. Take a moment if you'd like to write down some of your own ideas and then we'll continue. All right, now let's get some more solid rules on the designs for the symbols themselves. Let's take a look at the second attempt Dragon Company made for their four additional suits. For red, we have the shield and the rose or cross or flower. For black, we have the cup and the spear or the blade. These new suits take the examples we've seen in other decks and works them into more compact designs. I especially like how flower works elements in for the cross into its layout, while still being equally identifiable as a flower. They've provided an excellent spread demonstrating the various ways that these new designs work with the old ones and how the suits can be grouped together. So I'll link it in the description. Comment below if you think you have a particularly good idea, and if you want to show off what you've made to other artists and creators, you can join my Discord while I'll be having people post about what they've made. Even for as long as playing cards have been around, it's interesting to build a picture of how they've changed over time, and how they might change in the future. Are the suits we see today the final incarnations? Or, as the culture shifts, will new and exciting derivations take their place? I say exciting as if I'm not talking about the tiny drawings in the corners of ordinary playing cards. Regardless, thank you for watching. I hope you've gotten something out of this video. If card games are something that interests you, they're not what I normally talk about, but you might be interested in a game that my friends and I have been cooking up over the last year or so. It's not quite ready to go public yet, but I'll keep you posted here if you subscribe. So keep an eye out for a little something called Battle 54. And as always, freak out.